Good morning to you, dear brothers and sisters. Great to be with you this morning. Let us pray together. Father, we pray that you would open your word to our hearts and our hearts to your word. For Jesus' sake, amen. I'm sure you will agree with me that good news is a scarce commodity these days. What we see and hear just brings a long list of depressing headlines, economic and political uncertainty, inflation, the stock market, pandemic, Ukraine, Russia, China, Turkey, the threat of nuclear war. All this brings confusion on every hand. Gloom and despair, it seems, is rife. In all of this, I'm sure that we would welcome some really good news. Do you say amen to that? Amen. And that is precisely what the word gospel means. It comes from the Greek word evangelion and the Anglo-Saxon word God, brackets good, spell story. So when we as Christians refer to the gospel, we refer to the good news. That main message of the gospel is Emmanuel, God with us. Good news. The glorious message that God sent his only son, Jesus Christ, into this world to die, to pay the penalty of your sin and mine, that we might become children of God through faith in Christ alone. So in short, the gospel is that sum total of the saving truth God has revealed in his living word, the Lord Jesus Christ, and in his written word, the scriptures. Just to recap, we are in our series, Emmaus Road, and we're doing all the different genres of the scriptures. We've seen, if you like, the law, the Psalms, the wisdom literature, uh, the prophets. Now we're going to change direction because we're going to deal with the Gospels and then New Testament from on from there on. It's a different direction and it's a different genre. What we've got to understand is that the disciples on the road to Emmaus would have heard and seen Jesus in person. And as they were walking on that road, those amazing words, did not our hearts burn within us as he opened the scriptures to them. That is possible for each one of us today. As the scriptures are opened, our heart should burn within us. So if you're taking notes today, first note is, what are the Gospels? Well, they are the main source of information about Jesus. And the Gospels are a very particular type of literature or genre. They are not biographies in the modern sense of the word. Rather, they are accurate stories told in such a way as to convey a message about the significance of the life of Jesus when he was here on earth. And although in secular history there are a few scattered references to Jesus, like in Tacitus or Suetonius and Josephus, the main source of our information remains in the four Gospels. And they are the accurate testimony and bear witness to Christ and the good news of his salvation. Now, you will notice that the word gospel is never used in the New Testament of a book. But it was Mark, who, as far as we know, was the earliest writer, first applied that term, telling the story of Jesus. In Mark 1.1, 1, 1, Mark chapter 1, verse 1, he says, In the beginning of the gospel about Jesus Christ, the Son of God. So when we speak of the gospel of Matthew and Mark, Luke, etc., 
we ought to understand that that means the good news that was recorded by those gospel writers. These authors selected, arranged, presented their material according to their purpose as evangelists, declaring the good news. Second note is this. Why four gospels? Well, God has given us four different angles of Jesus. A fourfold portrait, if you like, of Jesus. The one and only Jesus is reviewed from four different angles. He is like a diamond with four facets. Each of the four gives us a unique perspective of his life. While each gospel can stand alone, Viewed together, they provide a complete picture of how God became man and died for the sins of the world. Let me give you an example. Imagine four people were to write about your life. Say your father, your child, a co-worker, and a friend. They would each focus on different aspects of your life and write from a unique perspective. Each may include different stories or even see the same event from different angles. But the differences wouldn't, would not mean they are in, are in error. Because when you put all those four accounts together, we'd get a richer picture of your life and character. And this is exactly what takes place with the four Gospels. These authors were theologians in their own right with their own particular emphasis about Jesus that they wanted to depict. It is one story with many dimensions. And it's an interesting fact that Jesus did not write a gospel. Now this is very important for us because if Jesus had written a gospel, it would have been something very different to what we have. You see, the Gospels are not by Jesus. They are about Jesus, his life and his teachings. And Matthew, Mark, and Luke are known in theological terms as the synoptic Gospels because they present Christ from a similar point of view. John, on the other hand, is known as the autoptic Gospel because he has a different emphasis to the other three. And I would recommend that you go to Pastor Mike's class after the service and you'll learn more about that side of things. So the third note is this, if you're taking notes, how do the writers portray Jesus? And we'll just have a brief look at the four. Firstly, you'll notice Matthew, the tax collector. He portrays Jesus as king and he has a prophetic outlook. He's the tax collector who became an apostle. He was a Jew. So he primarily wrote for the Jewish people. And he constantly quotes from the Old Testament scriptures to prove the messiahship of Jesus who came to set up his kingdom of God. And so as sovereign, he comes to reign and to rule. And Matthew ends his gospel with our Lord's resurrection. Next note is this on Mark. Mark portrays Jesus as servant. He has a practical outlook. Mark wrote primarily for the Romans. He begins his gospel with the public ministry of Jesus, <clears throat> heralded by John the Baptist. His gospel is short and to the point. It is action-packed. And his key words, if you read Mark's gospel or immediately and straight away. Mark was a very close friend of the apostle Peter and obviously Peter influenced him in his writings. A third of his gospel is devoted to the death of Jesus. He sees Jesus as that suffering servant and a servant he comes to serve and to suffer and Mark's gospel ends with our Lord's ascension. Next, if you're taking notes, Luke. Luke portrays Jesus as the son of man. 
and it's historical in outlook. Luke was a Greek, the only Gentile author of the Gospels, and as you well know, he was a physician by profession. The apostle called, Paul called him in Colossians 4.14, our dear friend Luke, the doctor. He was also a scholar. As he tells us, he carefully examined all the facts before he began to write. If any of you doctors, you know you have an analytical mind. You think things through. And Luke's key verse is in Luke 19.10. Luke 19.10. For the Son of Man came to seek and save that which is lost. See, whatever their race, nation, rank, age, sex, or anything else. And Luke brings women and children before us more than any other gospel. He was, of course, also the writer of the book of Acts. As a doctor, he obviously had a medical interest. And he speaks of the virgin birth with reserve and dignity. Healings are mentioned more in greater detail than the other writers, and he uses correct medical terms, such as a man in Luke 9.39 who had convulsions. He reveals not only the humanity of Jesus, but also his perfection as the Son of Man, his deity as well. The Son of Man, he comes to share and sympathize. Luke ends with the promise of the Holy Spirit. Our next note is on John. John portrays Jesus as the Son of God. And John has a spiritual outlook. He was known, as you remember, the disciple whom Jesus loved. He writes much later than the synoptic writers... And he emphasizes the deity of Jesus, the only Son of God who came into the world to be our Savior. John thinks deeply about everything, what everything meant. There's no genealogy. <clears throat> there's no reference to Jesus' birth. Instead, the opening verses begin with that eternal pre-existence of Jesus. John 1, 1 to 2. John's Gospel, 1, 1 to 2. In the beginning was the Word. That's the Logos. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. <clears throat> he was with God in the beginning. And if you remember, Genesis 1, 1 opens. Genesis 1, 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. And then we read in John 1, 14, the Word became flesh, made his dwelling among us. We have seen his glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. So you see, John has a different purpose and agenda to the other writers. He gives us, as it were, a close-up and personal look at Christ's identity. He shows us that Jesus, though fully God, came in flesh, to distinctly and accurately reveal God and that he is the source of eternal life to all who believe in him. John 20, verse 31, we read, but these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have eternal life. Half his gospel is made of the actual words of Jesus, and then he selects certain miracles of Jesus to set forth as signs of the deity of Jesus. As son of God, he comes to reveal and to redeem. And John ends with the promise of our Lord's return. Here then are the four Gospels. Without doubt, they are the most important documents in the world. And the emphasis of each one is important. It was through his death on the cross at Calvary that Jesus redeemed lost sinners. And I don't believe any, there's any more wonderful set of memoirs written. And we are entirely dependent for them on our knowledge of our Savior. 
Had they not been written, it's probably true that the church would never have survived. Their value is beyond price. So my fourth point, if you're taking notes, what is the message of the gospel? The gospel message is best found in John chapter 3, verses 1 to 18. There are obviously many passages that explain the message, but I would like to just expound on what must be one of the most well-known passages in the Gospels. However, I want to plead with you, do not let the familiarity of it rob us of its deep significance. So I want to read first nine verses, John 3, verses 1 to 9. If you've read these many times before, as I'm sure you probably have, won't you close your eyes and listen to these words as if it's the first time you've ever heard them? <clears throat> John 3, 1. Now there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a member of the Jewish ruling council. He came to Jesus at night and said, Rabbi, we know you are a teacher who has come from God, for no one could perform the miraculous signs you are doing if God were not with him. In reply, Jesus declared, I tell you the truth, no one can see the kingdom of God unless he is born again or born from above. How can a man be born when he is old? Nicodemus asked. Surely he cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb to be born? Jesus answered, I tell you the truth, no one can enter the kingdom of God unless he is born of water and the spirit. Flesh gives birth to flesh, but the spirit gives birth to spirit. You should not be surprised at my saying, you must be born again. The wind blows wherever it pleases. You hear its sound, but you cannot tell where it comes from or where it is going. So it is with everyone born of the Spirit. How can this be? Nicodemus asked. I would have loved to have been a fly on the wall to witness that staggering conversation between Jesus and a devout Jew, wouldn't you? You see, this encounter provides us with one of the most pivotal points of the Christian faith. And it's actually the hinge of the gospel and lies at the basis of our salvation. So I want to unpack it and see what we can learn. First thing to notice is that Nicodemus was an intellectual and influential religious leader. He was a respectable, upright living man in the community. He was not some drunkard or gangster. He was the kind of man that today we'd probably see carrying his Bible under his arm and doing and saying all the right things. Yet, dear friends, it is this very man, this very man, the intellectual, influential, religious leader that Jesus says in quick succession, verse 3, 5, and 7, you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven you must be born again. So Jesus emphasizes the necessity of a spiritual rebirth. The second thing to notice is that Nicodemus came to Jesus. We could speculate why he came at night, but that's not the main thing. The main thing is that Jesus came to Jesus. He obviously knew that something was lacking in his life and so he comes to talk to Jesus about it. Have you ever come to Jesus to talk about the things in your life? The third thing to notice is that Nicodemus states a fact. He didn't actually ask a question. But Jesus, you see, reads 
the question that's deep in his heart. And Jesus comes straight to the point and in effect tells him that without this one basic, essential, indispensable element in his life, all his religion, his position, his reputation, all his good works, all his knowledge of the law is totally and completely insufficient to get him to heaven. The fourth thing to notice is that Nicodemus completely missed the point, thinking that salvation was an act of man rather than an act of God. So what does it mean? My fifth point, if you're taking notes, the new birth is not religion, rules, or rituals. If ever a person could have been saved by religion, it would have been Nicodemus. It is not morality, keeping the golden rule, living a good life with high moral standards. Again, if Nicodemus could not make it, nor could you or I. Isaiah 64 verse 6 says, All of us have become like one who is unclean, and all our righteous acts, our self-righteous acts, if you like, are like filthy rags. No good works of ours are enough for God. You see, God demands perfection. Romans 3.10 tells us there is no one righteous, not even one. And Romans 3.23 tells us, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. Although Jesus reminds Nicodemus that he actually should have known better being a religious teacher in Israel, Nicodemus was actually confused and puzzled. Maybe sometimes you are as well. So Jesus goes on into great detail to explain exactly what it means to be born again or to be born from above. So my sixth note is this, if you're taking notes, the new birth is, firstly, it is a mystery. No one can explain, but a reality no one can explain away. And Jesus uses the wind as an illustration. We don't know where it comes from, and we don't know where it goes. And only a fool would say, I don't believe in the wind because I cannot see it. We can certainly feel it, and we can see the effects of the wind. In the same way, the unseen work of the Holy Spirit of God is real in the life of a person. How do you explain it, the change? A liar becomes honest. A drunkard becomes sober. A blasphemer now prays. Someone said that the new birth is not something that needs explaining, but experiencing. And if you've not had the experience, the explanation would be no good. And if you had the experience, the explanation is not necessary. A Scottish saint said this in the Scottish language. Any Scots people here, it's better felt than telt. If you're taking notes, it's a complete work of God. It is supernatural. It is not something we can do for ourselves. And here again, Nicodemus misunderstood what Jesus said. As our physical life on earth begins at our birth, so our spiritual life for heaven begins when we are born again. You see, Christians are not made. They are born again by the Spirit of God. And no matter what kind of religious profession you might have, or even if you were brought up in a Christian family, that doesn't make you a Christian any more than if you were born in a stable, you're not a horse. Doesn't matter if your name is on the church membership roll. If you've been baptized, if you've taken all the ceremonies of the church, that won't count unless you are born again. The next note is this. It is the transformation 
of a life. Listen to what the Apostle Paul said of himself. 1 Timothy 1, 13 to 14. 1 Timothy 1, 13 to 14. Even though I was once a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a violent man, I was shown mercy because I acted in ignorance and unbelief. The grace of our Lord was poured out on me abundantly, along with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. You see, that's what repentance means. A complete 180 degree turnaround so that you no longer live as you did and you no longer have that desire to sin. My best example of uh, repentance is if I was meant to be going to L.A. on the freeway, which, as you know, I don't go on freeway, so it's just an illustration for you. Um, If I was going to L.A. on the freeway and I find myself going to San Diego, (laughs) what am I supposed to do? I meant to stop doing what I'm doing, turn around 180 and go in the opposite direction. Dear friends, that's repentance, true repentance. Turning away from sin, not having it linger in our hearts as a desire. So drastic and radical change in the soul that can only be described as being born all over again. You see, this is not a change of name. It's not just turning over a new leaf, but it's a new life and nature within the soul. Listen to the Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 5.17. 2 Corinthians 5.17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creature. The word is actually creation. The old is gone, the new has come. Or as the hymn writer put it, something happened to me when I gave my heart to Jesus. Things I love far more have gone away. Things I love far more have come to stay. And dear friends, it's only possible by the grace and power of God through his Holy Spirit working in us. And yet this is not something optional, but imperative. Have you been born again? If you have, praise God. And what I'm going to say for the rest of my sermon, don't shut out. If you've been born again, just praise the Lord more and more for his grace and mercy. So Jesus now goes on to explain how the gospel works for you and me. Verses 10 to 18. We'll look at it piece by piece. Verse 10, in verse 10 of John 3, 10. He says to Nicodemus, you are Israel's teacher, said Jesus, and you do not understand these things. So Jesus here is challenging Nicodemus and taking him back as he reads the next part, which we will look at, to Numbers 21. He's a teacher of Israel. Go back to the Old Testament, Numbers 21, verse 9, when Moses was told by God to make that bronze snake and put it on a pole so that whoever would look up at the snake would be saved from its venom. See, this was prophetic of the coming Messiah, And Jesus, therefore, now is teaching Nicodemus a truth that he should have known. Verse 14 and 15. Verse 14 and 15. Just, Jesus telling Nicodemus, just as Moses lifted up the snake in the desert, so the Son of Man must be lifted up that everyone who believes in him may have eternal life. And Jesus is the one who would be lifted up on a cross and die for the sins of his people. By this great sacrificial act of love, God offered us a way back to him through his son. Perhaps Nicodemus would have been reminded as Jesus spoke to him of Isaiah chapter 52 and 53, as we learnt about last week. Imagine Nicodemus saying, wow, now I get it. His ha-ha moment. And we know that from John 19, verse 39, that Nicodemus continued as a follower of Jesus because he's with Joseph of Arimathea at the burial of Jesus. So you see, 
Jesus brings this conversation to a magnificent climax. John 3, 16 to 18. John 3, 16 to 18. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. Whoever believes in him is not condemned, but whoever do, who does not believe in God's only son is. Couldn't be clearer than that, could it? It's not difficult to see why John 3.16 <clears throat> must be one of the greatest verses in the Bible. It's certainly one of the best loved, the best known, most often memorized and quoted and cherished by God's people. There are only 26 English words in that verse, the same number of letters in our alphabet, and yet no other verse in Scripture has been used in the salvation of countless souls down through the ages. Martin Luther called it the miniature gospel, or as others have said, the gospel in a nutshell, because it contains the complete declaration of God's love, plan, provision for the salvation of men and women, boys and girls, sinful human beings like you and me. This is the very essence of the gospel. And this one little verse gives us the greatest good news, gospel, that anyone could want to hear and what more could be important, relevant and urgent for us to hear that right now. Let us refresh our hearts with this amazing message. If you've heard it before, just think again. I want to break down this verse and see four things this verse can teach us. Seventh note, the gospel is a gift wrapped in love. First point is the greatest love possible. For God so loved the world. So loved the world. This is a divine love. God's love. Human love can be something very beautiful. But all love, you see, comes from God anyway. The scriptures tell us God is love. And he is the author of love. The agape love. That unconditional sacrificial love that loves the unlovable, the unlovely. And we only love because he first loved us. It is a universal love, for God so loved the world, all people, no matter what race, color, class, culture, age, or gender, the world. But it's also a personal love. Who makes up the world, individual people like you and me. Substitute your name in that verse and make it personal. The Apostle Paul said in Galatians 2.8, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave up himself for me. Second thing we see here is that it's the greatest possible gift. He gave his one and only son. Now love must express, love must express itself. And love expresses itself in giving. Yes, I know it's possible to give without love, but it's impossible to love without giving. How do I know that God loves me? Well, his love is expressed in action. He gave that greatest possible gift he could give, his one and only son. The measure of love is sacrifice, and God gave us all he had to give. It cost God nothing less than his own beloved son. He gave all he had to give because he loves you and me so much. Third thing is, 
the greatest possible reason that whosoever believes in him should not perish. And this actually brings us to the basics of what this is all about. As we have seen, the Bible teaches us we have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We know that to be true of our own lives and we look around the world and see how true that is too. And the Bible says the wages of sin is death but the gift of God is eternal life. See, because we can do absolutely nothing to save ourselves by any of our so-called good works, self-righteousness. God in his great love and mercy and grace has made provision for our salvation through the life, death and resurrection of his son, Jesus Christ. Dear friends, all we have to do is to believe that. That is what he has done for us. We have to believe it, that Jesus did it for us on the cross. And you see, this is within the reach of the whosoever, whoever hears the message. But dear friends, we need to clarify, there are two kinds of belief. A head, intellectual kind, and a heart, or experimental kind. Now I hope there's a picture of my friend Charles Blondin. There he is. That is a true picture, you may remember him. The French acrobat, a uh, true story in 1860, pushed a wheelbarrow on a tightrope, there is he, that's an actual picture of him, across the Niagara Falls. Story has it that when he reached the other side, big crowd was there to applaud him and welcome him and he walked up to one man and he said do you believe that I can push a wheelbarrow over the Niagara Falls and the man said yes of course I've just seen it so the man said to him well hop on I'll take you back <laughs> they say that man's still running you see, illustration, head knowledge. He knew that he could do it. He's seen it with his own eyes like that. But to commit himself to Blondin was another matter. You see, it's so easy to believe with the head about Jesus. But so different to believe with the heart when you accept him. And dear friends, it's only as we accept personally and commit ourselves to the Lord personally and by faith receive that gift of salvation offered to us that it makes any difference in our lives. You see, you have got to first confess that you're a sinner. You've got to repent of your sin. That means turning away from it and simply ask for forgiveness, receiving the gift of eternal life. Someone said, many will miss heaven by 24 inches the difference between the head and the heart. Knowing it in the head is not enough. It has to be from the heart. And I want to ask you today, here in this sanctuary online, have you come to that point in your life? If not, why not? The fourth thing we learn from this verse, it's the greatest possible possession have eternal life. And the Bible deals here with the most solemn subject of eternity, that hereafter once we die and leave this earthly life. Someone said the perfect statistic, one out of one dies. But the big question is this, where will I spend eternity? It will either be in the presence of God in heaven with eternal life, or away from the presence of God with eternal death. Only two alternatives. Where will you spend eternity is decided here in this life. Whether you accept and receive the gift of salvation offered to you by the Lord Jesus Christ, or whether you reject that offer and falsely think that you can save yourself. This surely must be the most serious matter which we have to deal with. 
And the scripture is clear. In Acts 4.12, it says, Salvation is found in no one else. For there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. And in the words of the Lord Jesus himself, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Dear friends, if you have a problem with that, don't fight with me. Fight with Jesus who said it. It's his words, not mine. And in John 1.14 we read, Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. So I may ask you some personal question. Do you want to go to heaven? Have you experienced being born again? Jesus said, without being born again, you cannot get there. Someone asked the great preacher Charles Spurgeon, why must I be born again? And Spurgeon simply said, because you must be born again. <laughs> and perhaps I'm speaking to someone worn out by the burden of sin and guilt in your life. You may have tried everything, but don't know the way out. Let me be quick to tell you the good news, the gospel, is that Jesus came into the world to save sinners just like you and me. Maybe you're tired of trying to be religious, going through all the motions, attending church, becoming a church member even, but finding no peace in your soul. Maybe you're tired of hearing all the bad news around. Maybe, like Nicodemus, you've missed the point. But today, you just want to have a new life with purpose and meaning. Well, here is the greatest good news that anyone could hear. Just like Nicodemus, you can come to Jesus and talk with him. You see, he is willing to receive you just as you are, just where you are, whatever your need and problem. If you're willing to take him at his word, Acts 2.21 says, and everyone who calls on the Lord, name of the Lord will be saved. You see, you must personally trust in that finished work of Christ upon the cross for you, as the Apostle Paul, he gave up himself for me. You must receive him into your heart as your personal Lord and Savior, and you will be born again. And the experience, the peace of God in the forgiveness of your sin, you won't need an explanation. You will know that experience of a transforming power of the Holy Spirit in your life, and you will be assured of the gift of eternal life because God's Spirit witnesses with your spirit that you're a child of God. Listen again to the words of that Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has gone. The new has come. I don't know that I'm speaking to somebody today who's never found that to be true. Dear friend, if you want this to happen to you today. I'm going to ask you to pray this prayer with me from the depths of your heart. Just as I pray, let it come from your heart. Lord Jesus, I come to you now as I am with all my problems, all my questions. I'm very conscious of my sin and my need for your forgiveness. I know that there is nothing I can do to obtain your acceptance. But I thank you, you came from heaven to save me by dying on the cross and rising again for me. As best as I understand, I want to repent of my sin and turn away from it. I humbly ask you for your forgiveness and acceptance. I'm trusting you, Lord Jesus, for my salvation. 
Come into my life as my saviour to cleanse me. Come into my life as my Lord to control me. Send your Holy Spirit into my life to empower me. Make me part of your great family and I will serve you all the remaining years of my life in complete obedience to your word. Amen.